used by distributions like Ubuntu, Fedora, Sorin OS, Pop OS, and Debian, GNOME is one of the most, if not the most, popular Linux desktop environment. Welcome to this new series of videos. Today, we're going to explore the history of GNOME. To support the channel, you can like, subscribe, donate, or leave a comment. I always hold them. Thank you. It all starts back on August 15th, 1997, created by Mexican software engineers Miguel de Icaza and Federico Mena. Icaza wanted to make a completely free desktop environment for Linux. He met Federico Mena while both were studying at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. The name GNOME was an acronym for GNU Network Object Model Environment. <laughs> The project was made with a new toolkit back then called GTK that stood for the GIMP toolkit, later renamed to the GNOME toolkit. They decided to not use Qt because at that time, its toolkit used a proprietary license, so it is not surprising to know that they chose to license their DE under the LGPL and their apps under the GPL. Analyzing the UI of GNOME GNOME 1, released on March 3rd, 1999, we can notice a lot of differences to the interface we know today. First, it looks a lot like Windows. If you removed the bar on the bottom and just showed me quickly the main window, I would think it was Windows. Speaking about that bar, it was called the GNOME panel. From left to right, we see an arrow to toggle the visibility of the panel. There is also another one on the right edge. We have the main menu button with the GNOME logo, a list of applications, and customizable applets on the right, like this one for switching to another virtual desktop, a feature from the 90s actually, the list of opened apps, and a clock. There was also a desktop with a wallpaper and icons. GNOME 2 was released in June of 2002, providing a new layout that is still loved by many today this day. It looked cleaner and more modern due to the new theme called Clear Looks, which as a fun fact was also available for Windows XP. On the new top bar, we have a couple of menus that provide shortcuts for different actions and places. For example, you can see the Applications menu showing all your programs, the Places section with shortcuts to the home directory and other folders, and the System menu that has shortcuts cuts for settings. On the right, you have applets for things like the clipboard, clock, and sound. On the bottom panel, you find a button for showing the desktop as well as a virtual desktop switcher. On this same panel, you should see your opened apps behaving like a taskbar. Things would get controversial with the release of GNOME 3. Originally, it was going to be a small update to GNOME 2, but the release of the brand new GNOME shell changed everything. Now, the focus was to make a simple user experience with a workflow very different to the traditional desktop one that OSs like Windows have, removing by default the minimize and maximize buttons. The panel was replaced by the dash, which contained your applications, but was only shown when you accessed the activities menu, same one where you would find your vertical virtual desktops, your opened window and applications and a search bar. The top bar remained with elements like status icons, a clock, and tray icons. By default, a new theme was made called Atwaita. Applications were redesigned to be more consistent, and the human interface guidelines were more solid. The window manager was replaced with Mutter. Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux, criticized this new version of GNOME, stating that, Quote, the developers have apparently decided that it's too complicated to actually do real work on your desktop and have decided to make it really annoying to do. He switched temporarily to the XFCE desktop environment before returning to GNOME in 2013, as extensions to the shell made it easier for him to adapt. 
However, he was not the only one dissatisfied with the change, as a fork of GNOME 2 called Mate arrived. Its goal is to remain with the previous workflow, and it is still maintained to this day. Distributions like Linux Mint made their own desktop environment based on GNOME, creating Cinnamon, a simple desktop environment that follows a Windows workflow with a taskbar and start menu aimed at beginners. Ubuntu followed the trend and created its own desktop environment called Unity that used the panel on the left side to see your opened applications as well as a top bar with system information. It was trying to adapt itself to different devices like phones with Ubuntu Touch, but unfortunately the project never gained enough funds for this to become a success. Returning to a tweaked GNOME 3 with Ubuntu 17.10 in 2017, eventually more changes like the removal of the system tray and desktop icons turned it into a completely different thing. It was time for a new release. Publishing GNOME 40 on March 24, 2021, as the name implies, now the versioning scheme is different, with major releases having an incremental number instead of being GNOME 3.x. The workflow was very much improved, merging an expose view, the dash, a global search, horizontal virtual desktops, an applications menu in just one interface, the overview. In my opinion, this is what GNOME 3 should have been since the beginning, and once you adapt yourself to the workflow, it is very clean and satisfying to use. It now includes more shortcuts and touchpad gestures to work with this new workflow. The Athweta theme got cleaner and easier to use with Livatweta, an API that now only does not feature a theme but also custom widgets that follow the guidelines of GNOME. This has the benefit of making dark and light theme work out of the box, and most applications can adapt themselves to different input methods like keyboards, mice, and touch, as well as different screen sizes. Just take a look at the Athweta demo and this new prototype for an application I'm making. It was really easy to make and I would love to make a tutorial series on this. GNOME has been working closely with new technologies like the Wayland Display Protocol, Pipewire, Flatpak, and the Portals API, leading us to an interesting feature of Linux. Recently, a video showing the advancements on the GNOME Mobile shell was uploaded, and honestly, I am impressed by how good it looks. I think it has the potential to be the best competitor for Android and iOS, even though there are still some rough edges. The latest version is going to be released this month, along with GTK 4.10, introducing new features like a background's app indicator that would be a better replacement for the missing tray icons, improvements to the quick settings menu that now shows more information about some toggles, and finally, after 18 years, we will get thumbnails in the file picker. Honestly, I'm pretty excited for this new release and Linux in general. Other operating systems seem to be moving slowly, but Linux, it's just going really fast. The GNOME Circle initiative allows developers to join and contribute to the ecosystem, getting also support from the GNOME Foundation. It seems to have been a success as they recently reached 50 apps in this program. There is also GNOME Incubator that lets a third party app become a first party program that will be included in the official releases. So, this was the history of GNOME, a video that I wanted to make for some time now. And yes, I'm planning to make videos about the history of other operating systems and software in general. As always, I accept suggestions, so you can leave a comment. I might not read it as fast, as I've degoogled my phone now, and I don't have the YouTube Studio app anymore, but I still read them. Thank you so much for watching, see you in the next one.